Welcome, fellow Armchair Generals. This is Gamer1745 here with my continuing playthrough of Hearts of Iron 3's Black Ice. And of course, we're playing as the US. I want to particularly thank Tim, Strongarm, Niagara, Timothy, and Sir Toyjet for support on Patreon. But what I really want everyone to do is hit that like button, just smash it as hard as you can. And of course, post a comment below. Those really help with channel growth. And I'd appreciate it a lot if you would be willing to do that. Thank you for doing it if you have. All right, we are getting ready here. We um, are trying, destroying a lot of German forces here, including um, the Hermann Goering division. Hello, Ari. And we are invading out here in the Pacific. Oh. No, I'm thinking about this. No. We won out here, we won here. Okay, well, we won those two places, so let's. What? Oh, we're still a little technically defending. Let they go by and attack there. Uh-oh, Ethernet cable's dead. Yeah, that wouldn't be a good. Wouldn't be good. Okay, so massive victory here. Massive victory. The Hermann Goering division was in this pocket. So it is gone. Some DAC units were gone as well. What are we facing here? Okay. Okay, here. Okay, well, yeah, no, yeah. Actually, we we took out, um, Spain is in the Axis, so we landed and we took this out here. Um, and then did a, instead of a naval invasion, we did a breakout um, into there. Um, let's see, we would give them money for fuel. No, I don't mind giving you the money, but it just, I'm not bringing fuel. I'm not shipping fuel across the Mediterranean, Turkey. Yeah, yeah, no, we're 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 dealing with um, Vichy forces there, but Italy's done well early on and is somewhat continuing. And I, uh, somehow they've been supplying here. I don't know, um, but what really has been a problem is Britain has not had enough transports, so they collapsed in North Africa. Yeah, enough, enough, you know, to transport fuel and whatnot. So they've collapsed there. But Russia, you know, Germany a while ago did take Leningrad, but Russia's pushing them back pretty heavily here. So, and we see here along the coast is just a lot of garrison units. So, yeah, um, Britain keeps trying to break out of Gibraltar, but it doesn't go well for them. Yeah, um, well, the big problem is, well, we have some forces here, um, but whenever I land, it becomes a British port and I run out of fuel because Britain doesn't have enough transports to fuel places. They can't get any fuel here. 
that's the problem. I can't I can't get fuel in British ter or supplies in British territory. Not just fuel, but but supplies. These guys are stuck out here for some reason without fuel. Okay, the Philadelphia Experiment. Let's read about this. I made a movie. I remember watching it years and years ago. I think it's more like a TV, made-for-TV movie or something. But The Philadelphia Experiment is an alleged military experiment that is said to have been carried out by the U.S. Navy at the Philadelphia Shipyards in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Sometime around the 28th of October, 1943, the U.S. Navy destroyer escort Eldridge, DE-173, was claimed to have been rendered invisible or cloaked to enemy devices. The story is widely believed to be a hoax. The Navy maintains that no such experiment was ever conducted, that the Details of the story contradict well-established facts about the SS Eldridge and that the alleged claims do not um, conform to known physical laws. The experiment was allegedly based on aspects of some unified field theory, a term coined by Albert Einstein to describe a class of potential theories. Such theories would aim to describe mathematically and physically the interrelated nature of forces that comprise electromagnetic radiation, gravity, in other words, uniting the fields of electromagnetism and gravity into a single field. I could see how Something like this could be talked about and believed, even though it didn't happen, because there is so much secrecy going on during the war, f for obvious reasons. Though, even in Britain, I would say, let alone the United States, Germany, the Axis in general, have very little intelligence gathering capabilities. I've watched a lot of movies made during the war and they some of them are about like the merchant marine and other ones that they're all very much hitting on you know loose lips sink ships you know no one should talk out of turn and you know it's all good practice to not like talk about when convoys are going to sail or your production numbers And yeah, if they didn't, if they weren't careful at all, there would be a lot of talk floating around. That That's true. But I, compared to the realities that at least what we know today, feeling and remembering when a lot of people wrote books, the whole um, enigma, um, you, know, co you know, the um, ultra secret, you know, the code, you know, reading the Germans code was kept secret for years and years after the war. So a lot of people did not know, did not put that into the calculus of looking at the war. So maybe there were more German or Italian spies, or maybe there were more Latin American spies that were operating around, but I really don't think so. You know, but yeah, I, I totally agree with the idea that you shouldn't talk too much, but I think there was an overemphasis on it. Now, what I'm guessing that there was an experiment. I mean, just a guess for my part, but and particularly because being with a destroyer escort, and in 43, what they may be trying to do is trying to render a, and if you look at electromagnetism, um, 
trying to render a ship um, non-magnetic so it doesn't trip magnetic mines or or torpedoes because remember and um, if you if you don't already know know of the channel you should drop chinophil um, guy who does great work on um, topics naval so um, if you want to and very heavy focus on World War two so you should check it out and he's been going over the um, a multi-part um, thing you know not just one episode but me a multi-part series but in between his other works dealing with the um, submarine warfare in the Pacific and talking about the Mark 14 torpedo and all the problems with it and that torpedo was meant to be a really great torpedo and would a single with a single torpedo sink a battleship or sink a carrier let alone a transport ship but through much of the war it wouldn't even do any of that at all the whole idea and, and, and it has so many flaws but the whole idea is that it's supposed to go underneath the ship get close enough to the ship and then detonate below the ship um, because when you do that most all the force goes straight up because that's the path of least resistance because when you hit an explosion yes it wants to go in all directions at once but if it's like an explosion laying flat on the ground well all the explosive or you know virtually all the explosive powder power is going to go skyward because um you know it's not going to push into the to the ground when it's under the water it wants to go straight to the surface because that again path of least resistance because it's getting pressure from all sides but the least amount of pressure is from the top so it works like a sort of like a cannon or whatever pointed straight up into the air so you know whenever you see these explosions underwater a big spout of water comes up straight up because that's the way it works well if you know anything about the mark 14 their magnetic exploders were just not working for multiple reasons either detonating too early or just not detonating at all all kinds of stuff now with a conventional you know contact warhead of a torpedo a lot of battleships either were built with or later given um, torpedo blisters in which they are um, a unarmored um, often sectionalized and you know with water type compartments in it um, ex whole extensions to either side for the great you know for um you know 60 70 percent of the length of the ship where it's most likely to impact with the idea um now it does add a little bit of weight to the ship but actually it's not that bad because when it's adding weight it's adding weight to the bottom and most of the time with a lot of these ships and i've been reading about some of the destroyers and they're worrying about you know adding too much weight to the ship well really i think the weight they're worrying about is weight above the waterline on the you know above the deck you know adding more guns or whatever to making it top heavy not so much that it would ride lower in the water i think riding lower in the water is an issue but i don't think it's the main issue i think the main issue is sticking more guns or um armor or whatever um including more radars and other elements all on the top decks of like particularly destroyers that are fairly small as you're adding weight up there which makes them more unstable i think that's the big issue with with adding more weight more so than riding lower in the water well putting the torpedo blister on yeah it adds a little bit of weight but you're also creating a big void air void spot but you're also making it less hydrodynamic meaning not going through the water as efficiently but they're generally big enough that it'll detonate the um, torpedo into a air pocket that will not transfer the um, the explosion too badly hopefully into the ship so yeah and then what will happen is that section will start taking on water and what they do then is they have the ability to flood the opposite section to balance it out so they'll the ship will just ride lower in the water hopefully 
fine kind of thing. So you balance that out and counter flooding is it's called. And so that works. And so you need to hit it with a lot of a lot of torpedoes to take out a, a uh, battleship or a carrier if they have these torpedo blisters and like the Taiho and others were given those later on in the war as Taiho has constructed, I believe. Um, but torpedo blisters don't stop because they're on the sides. They don't stop things coming beneath them. What I think this is an attempt, Well, and I'll let, read Aries' um, comments in a minute. Um, what I think this was was an attempt to create a um, condition in which is, you know, does not um, have electromagnetic signal for a likely a torpedo, but possibly, you know, magnetic mine, but I think torpedo. And you're doing it with a real ship, but a destroyer escort is sort of a, an American equivalent of a frigate, if you will. Um, it's a, a DE is smaller. Um, but not as small as like a, um, a Canadian Corvette. Um, yeah, it just it's sort of definitions, but um, and so they're doing it with a real ship, but they're not taking a at least by forty three, you know, a ship that's desperately needed somewhere, and so that's what I think they're doing. That's my guess is that they're trying to make it um, invisible to not to like people seeing it. Um, but to, you know, um, magnetic um, observation, if you will, or detection or whatever. That's my guess. And whatever they found, I, you know, I don't know if anything remarkable happened. Um, but I could easily see somebody either during the war or immediately after the war that was somehow responsible for, or, or somehow involved in it um talking about it and then a few other people that sort of her were you you served on it and sort of talked about it but everybody has to well no we weren't trying to make it invisible yeah and, you know no no there was no cloak cloaking this ship didn't disappear um i don't know that i'm just sort of guessing that that's probably the what's behind it all Oh, uh, we have another guy, another another situation over on Facebook. It looks like Arno, um, same person. Maybe you ought to ban them. It looks like, okay. Um, maybe invasion of the islands in the Med. You could go better. Yeah, we're. I first the whole plan is to first control the the um, the Mediter or the you know the African coast. I'm concentrating on that um, area. And then we will look at um, various Spanish and Italian islands for sure. Well, I think it's more than just Airy staying with his sister. So I think I think it's more of the family staying there, and. After a while, I'm sure they're getting tired of it, but yeah. Ari, just since they're talking about it, Ari lives in Kentucky and in the area that was hit pretty bad a while ago with devastation, we can say. I don't want to just say storms and minimize it, but devastation. So yeah, so we're all rooting for Ari to get back to some semblance of normalcy. I'm just looking at you. Yeah, the family's there. Yeah. I sort of understood that that was the case. And that's got to be a crowded situation. Hey, we're Americans. We we left Europe to get out of crowded situations and move them to the big wide open where we could spread out and not live, you know, you not live on top of each other, jammed in with each other, except for, of course, New York. They like to do that in New York for some reason, and I don't understand it. But I guess 
you know, somebody's got to want to live there. I wouldn't. Be looking for the, you know, the magic win the war. Heck, I guess not. So. Okay, well, um, from, from Restream, no, no, you can't live with me. You, you can come live in America for all I care, but you can't come live with me. Well, supposedly, I don't know what's happened, but Restream has picked up Mohammed Razil. Sign up with your email and zip code to our officials and contact you. Well, maybe because there's a, uh, but I think you should be able to see it. Then there, there is a, um, you know, a HTTP web address. Maybe they're waiting for me to approve it or something, but I think you have full access. I don't know. What do you think about the invasion of Corsica? Well, I'm not against the idea. I'm waiting. I'm trying to get my transports across the Pacific right now. They're moving at two kilometers an hour because for some reason they're they're thought to be out of supply. Um, although the where they're going has supply, so I I don't get it. Um, it's not that I don't want to do it. I just don't know if I I need to concentrate. I feel I need to concentrate my forces on the conquest of North Africa first, because I feel too weak as it is. I may not be. I may be super strong. Now, once I get North Africa solved, you know, and cut off all these Italian forces, then absolutely the islands are going to be hit. And hit strongly. So, yes. How are we doing out here? Okay, we're starting to wear these guys down a little bit. How are we doing in air groups? Okay. Uh, we got five. What we're going to do is we're going to send these guys back, hopefully before they all die out, though I think one of them may be already. I think this war in Ukraine is going to kill the EU. In a way, it might have appeared to people it would be a thing that would strengthen the EU, but I think it's going to kill the EU faster because of the fuel situation. Um, so I think the... lack of fuel that Europe will be facing will be something that will pit European countries versus European countries and the populace will not like the idea of of suffering for the bad mistakes of other European countries. Like, I guess Germany, I guess finally they've announced in um, Germany the three last nuclear power plants are not going to be shut down, though I'm not sure of that. And I don't know, maybe Arno could correct me. Was it, is it Belgium or the Netherlands that had one power, one nuclear power plant that 
is scheduled still scheduled to be shut down or is be or has been shut down within the last 30 days or something like that um i <sighs> And I just don't see Belgium. Okay, thanks, Arno. Yeah. Um, and I just really have to wonder how the people of Europe are going to think about this. As time goes on. So I think this winter is going to be really harsh. I already know from talking to quite a bit with Eric, there is a, okay, we're gonna stop pushing here because we've lost too much. Wait till reinforcements come up. Yeah, they're counterattacking, but we can hold that. Um, they're suffering um, high energy prices because they're, Continuing to sell um, electricity to, um, you know, south, whether it's to Denmark or the Netherlands or Germany or wherever. And it's driving their electricity up, their prices up. So they're not happy with it. Um, people who have always voted left i mean i would call it communism i mean it may not be full-on leninist marxism but people that have been voting you know for the workers party you know at minimum what we would call in my opinion socialism okay we're down to very low escort so let's Do a few scores. So that are now seriously for the first time, maybe in their lives, literally, um, thinking about voting for something a bit more right wing. Now, I don't, in real perspectives, I don't know how right wing the right wing is, meaning are they just only partially socialist and not fully socialist or whatever um but i'm seeing and it's because of energy prices i think jordan peterson said something along the lines of eco terrorists have been holding your hostage for decades and sit on high horse when importing gas they need oh god yeah there there are i mean i call them and I'd broaden the scope to eco-mentalists, though, um, which are just men people that are you know I mean, we could argue about global warming is it even happening? I don't know I don't have all the facts I'm not going to argue it right here, right now I do know from history that we've had, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, because that's where most history is, people. I don't know if you realize this. Most everybody lives in the Northern Hemisphere. This map isn't entirely correct, but it's right about through here is where um, the equator is in Africa. So, you know, there's huge, you know, like, like 100 million people or something living today in Nigeria alone, or 80 million, and a similar amount of people living in Egypt, uh, you know, all along the, the River Nile kind of place, and other places that are largely large populations in, in Africa, where you get down here and, you know, south of the equator, it gets a lot less, but there's still a bunch, but it's a lot drier and a lot less below the equator. And now this way is sort of off because the equator sort of goes through um, a bit more northern here in Brazil, I believe. You know, so it's not quite aligned here. 
And so, yeah, you have Argentina, Chile, and most of the people in Brazil live south of the equator, true. But, um, you know, and so, the, but that runs, you know, sort of through here. So I think like most of the populous parts, some, I think Java is below the equator, but, you know, it's coming through here. So, yeah, I mean, okay. But if you look at human history, you know, it's China, India, Europe, I mean, you know, in the Middle East, that's all Northern Hemisphere. That's for history, meaning written word that we have. Because, yes, there are, um, there were books in the um, Aztec Empire. Very, very few of them remained. A lot of them because they were religious texts or at least perceived to be so. And the um, Catholic missionaries coming in were burning all that stuff. Very few examples um, remain. Then, of course, all their, you know, pictographs, hieroglyphs, because it's all hieroglyphs, not Egyptian, but just other ones on the temples. So, yeah, there was writing down in, you know, what, a, you know, in Aztecs and the Incas and whatnot. So, yeah, but um, outside of that, basically, there's no real writing in North America and no real writing in Africa. And obviously down here, no real writing until, you know, Europeans are showing up. So, hello, Penjori, how you doing? I don't think that's the, that's what black and white. Now I think now all the left and green are people are happy about horse green. It's like a uh, wet dream them. Well, we used to call them watermelons, um, the green party. Um, because they are green on the outside and red on the inside. Um, I truly believe the Western European green movement is just a, you know, a continuation of communism uh, and using the environment as the excuse. Um, the only places that a communist revolution has ever been successful have been in, ag in agrarian societies. And that, according to Marx, is not the way it's supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen in a sort of industrial or post-industrial, you know, um, type world. But the only place they've ever been successful um, have been in agrarian societies. Russia, Yes, sure. You had, you know, some industry in Leningrad, sort of Moscow as access, you know, in the Tula arsenal. But really, Russia was an agrarian society. China, obviously, an agrarian society. A lot of places in Latin America, you know, um, like, you know Cuba, Nicaragua, agrarian societies. And, you know, communism, like into East Germany, into Poland, into Romania, was imposed there, you know, post-World War. Never, not a revolution. And capitalism, unlike what Marx has thought, brings about near universal prosperity. I was just thinking about this a few hours before stream. People don't know how rich they are here. People just don't know how rich they are. Because most people in what we'll call Western Europe and North America have better dental and health, uh, you know, medical um, support than the richest person in the world, the Rockefeller, the whoever, in 1900, okay, in 1900, compared to the year 2000, in just 100 years, dental and health, um, you know, have improved so much. You know, the idea of false teeth that can be permanently put into your your um, mouth and feel entirely real to you. you. You don't realize they're not, you know, they're not something awkward and you take in and out or whatever. Can be done now. And but even the poorest people on the basic levels of getting, you know, just teeth properly, you know, pulled out, you know, if they're really bad or, ca you know, cavities filled, 
so just on the basic health and then uh, how rich you are in um compared to 1900 how how cities smell sweet instead of smelling except for new york city i understand it's been so long since i've been there well maybe san francisco san francisco smells like shit um and i mean it literally and um new york i hear smells a, like a mixture of urine and sour milk but outside of those places and those are those are local choices to smell that way not because it's inherent on cities um for some reason they like the smells i don't know um the cities are clean because we have good clean water going into the into the cities and good sewage management going out those make you rich people okay no you don't get to maybe buy the private jet or even own a personal car but you're still effing rich compared to what people were a hundred or even just 50 years ago and the technology you have and that my friend Ari is on a cell phone because his ethernet cable is broken and yeah I know he's he's you know I mean he, he's homeless right now and that he's living with his his family's living with his sister in his sister's home so it's you know technically homeless but he is rich in that he has a cell he has a computer a, a, a micro computer in his hand that's being rich people that's being rich so yeah i mean there's always going to be people richer than you you know there you know and unless unless <laughs> unless we have like elon musk or somebody like that in the chat right now there's always going to be people richer than you everybody or watching this so there's always going to be somebody richer than you certainly but humanity with capitalism and i don't and i mean free market oriented competitive market capitalism in the west is rich okay so that means why is anybody going to um die for communism okay why are you going to die you know why are you going to have a communist revolution so the communists move into the environmentalist fields first trying to scare us with the coming ice age that's what they were trying to do now they're trying to scare us with coming you know um boiling planet and melting of the ice caps and they're using that to scare people into supporting communism and to create scarcity we should have an abundance of energy not trying to use less energy we should be hey you want to you well can we can we somehow force four times as much power into your computer to make it work better great you know let, let's let's build because we have we have limitless energy just look at all this energy you know what we're looking at we're looking at hydrogen we've got hydrogen forever okay you know and if you believe in global warming and you're worrying about sea level rise let's start converting that that the sea to to you know separating out the oxygen from the hydrogen and we've got forever fuel out here all we got to do is get a good process to to uh, to energy efficiently separate out the hydrogen i i don't know how to solve that but they don't want to do those energy solving problems and yes i know the price of uranium is up because france is actually expanding nuclear power plants but of course being france they don't um do it in an efficient manner and they don't do maintenance in an efficient manner so a lot of their power plants are offline for maintenance right now literally like a third of the amount of power that france can generate is going to be offline this winter um you know so the green movement is just is just is what is they're using to motivate the common person into support communism so you're absolutely right um uh pen jory i haven't seen you here before but um maybe i just don't remember your name sorry if you have been good to have you here if you're new please hit the um 
follow button. But yeah, so that that is my analysis of things. And I think yeah, Europe European populace don't want to get nuked for Ukraine. Uh-oh. Okay. Okay, guys. Um We've got to, okay, um, stop the invasion. Uh, okay, we've let this get out of hand. So all of these forces first come back up to here. Rebase. Sail is more or less a group. Get out of here. I think we need to take some of these other islands. Well, I don't know. Because we're just getting hit from too much air from here. And, um, two units there. Nine units there. We got to do it. Hey, Sir Toyja, how you doing? One, 100 years ago, no one, almost no one, had refrigerators, microwaves, cars, radios, TVs, cameras, electric lighting, nearly this amount of food with this uh, variety. Absolutely, Ari. That's what I mean when I say we are all... Good. Oh, I'm doing great. Good to hear you're doing better. Um, Eric did tell me you weren't feeling well yesterday, but glad you're doing better. And so, yeah, we are all rich. Now, again, there are people that are a lot richer than other people. Um, and, you know, yeah, there are people that are really hurting in life. I'm not going to try to pretend there aren't. Now, there's often uh, things like drug drug addiction and other things that make it really bad. And I'm talking about the Western world. I'm not talking about particularly Ethiopia. They're going through a civil war, the Tigray civil war, you know. And yeah, life sucks and for millions and millions of people. And even if you throw in China, we're getting into billions of people. And even in, even in India, which is on a up generally upward tilt for the 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 country, but there's still huge amounts of poverty. Yeah, I I know all this, but even there, even in a place like India versus a hundred years ago in India, and one of the reasons there is so many um, more people in Africa is because of. Uh, various inoculations, you know, um, vaccines that are cheap enough to get in there that so many more children um, survive to adulthood than used to. So even their life is, is a hell of a lot better than it was 100 years ago. So, yeah. Um, you know, so that's, you know, so you got to keep keep it in that, in that time, that, uh, that, that, not time, but that um, viewpoint uh, about how things have gotten so much better before you get and realize that all these people that are want more uh, or worry about um, what is it income inequality you know in the Western world. I don't care about income inequality. I care about standards of living. If the standards of living is really bad for people, well, then that's a problem. And that's what I think is going to ha is going to be a shock to Europe. I I think it's. I really hope, and I don't believe they're quite crazy enough in Europe to try to expand the war outside of Europe. Though I really don't know what's going on with that pipeline problem. Um. Well, I wouldn't put it past the eco-mentalists to have done it. And just using this whole war as an excuse. Okay, well, we're getting some assault landing ships. We've got some more assault landing ships coming. we got some divisions, but yeah, let's build another division. Um, yeah, I think semi-motorized. We're not going to go too expensive here. I'm going to do artillery, empty tank. Let's come down here, give it some trucks. Um, let's give it motorized support so it doesn't slow it down. 
any more than needed. And yeah, let's give it some dedicated. And not for the America, they had they use lots of motorcycles, but really no uh, motorcycle reconnaissance like Germany did. They had jeeps and other light trucks that were doing um, non-armored car re reconnaissance. But there, yeah, the price between oh, it's so much cheaper. Let's 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 be true, truly American here and do armored cars. Armored cars was really more the thing for the Americans. I remember watching a Cold War propaganda cartoon about how thorough capitalism and competition it has led way to great in inventions. It was made by a college, I forget the name out of hand, but basically made it all anti-communist cartoons during the 60s and such. They were great. Yes, the pipeline is all part of Putin's plan to freeze Europe, I'm pretty sure. Well, I really have to wonder... Putin can just turn turn the, the pipelines that are damaged, and I don't know how repairable or not they are. All Putin can turn that off, but now if he turns it off, obviously the blame goes to Russia. Where if he or somebody else were to blow it up, maybe the blame would go to somebody else instead of Russia. But he could turn them off. And it would always be that if you stop supporting Ukraine, I'll turn them back on kind of thing. But if they're unable to be turned on because they're either destroyed or non-operational because of, you know, meaning meaning destroyed as in you got to relay all new. I don't know if you're going to have to relay all new pipeline or whether you can just go in and, um, you know, cut out the damage sections and stick in a, you know, new good section and then pump out all the water and boom, there it goes. You know, I don't know. Um, I just don't know enough about pipelines to, to know that. But there's the other pipeline that's coming down from Scandinavia that just opened up that wasn't hit. Wouldn't Putin's people also hit that one too? If you're hitting pipelines? And the pipelines were very carefully hit in supposedly, my understanding, international waters, meaning they did not go into German, Danish, or Swedish national territory, at least as defined by the United States. And we, de we define where international waters is. I mean, there's sort of a convention that goes back to England defining where international waters, and we just sort of picked it up and, and continued that. Um, so now we do at least I we know that Soviet subs and whatnot and certain vessels that can launch can covertly subs have played around either off the Norwegian coast or the Irish coast or wherever forget where and then oh there's like twelve feet of cable missing from the cable that undersea cables and you have to literally re relay it you can't you can't just go pick it up or go splice in it because there's a lot of little you know um, fiber optic or whatever i don't know if they're fiber optic or copper or what but there's a lot of little cables that would need to be hook, hooked up in it so basically that whole line becomes useless once you cut it um it has to be relayed and i don't think either i don't think because these all have happened within the last few years um and again, hit out in international waters, and the only likely um, country at the time was Russia. So, um, yeah, I'm not saying Russia didn't do it, but when you have literal statements from back in, I think it was June, that... Um, uh, Biden said he was going to do it. I mean, he didn't say, we're going to send, you know, SEAL divers down to this location and blow up your pipeline, everybody. But he's, he did say, we're going to shut down Russia's pipeline, or Nord Stream pipelines, if they um, go into Ukraine. 
He said that. I mean, why did he say that? I don't know, but he said that. And somebody shut down the pipeline. So, do you guys not believe Biden? Do you think, and th this was, you know, six months ago. I mean, he was, he, he might still have been somewhat mentally capable at that point of thinking. Um, so do you don't believe Biden? I thought, I thought all you Europeans, well, Airy not, but that most of you Europeans out there trusted and liked Biden. Barrier group doctrine, very good. We like that. Probably that would be need to be ended because yes, it's 1945 date. And armored HQs have advanced. If you notice, I because I just haven't needed them at all. Oh um, no, it's here. I've not been cashing in and getting the HQs, but I'm researching this primarily for the reduce the delay between attacks that is a big important thing to me um, so i would highly recommend you doing that you know researching these hqs and if you don't want them for your nation germany has a bit more use for the a lot of those hqs and that they can use them as sort of occupation troops that are cheap or free or whatever well let's do Alt. so i'm very much reserving judgment on who i think cut the pipeline I do not know who cut the pipeline or let the dogs out. But, um, uh oh, uh oh. Well, somehow, some crazy how, they've convinced Portugal to join the Axis. Now, I will admit that Italy's doing fairly well in the Mediterranean. But there's still um, British sitting in Gibraltar. And Russia is getting nearly to push into Romania. So... One last sort of thing today. Um... I know because of modern speak and this guy um, named Orwell warned us about this. Damn, these guys are just moving super slow at two kilometers. Now. Warned us about new speak or whatever in his book, 1984, that they make words they they change the meaning of words that make them meaningless. You know, unity is strength, or diversity is strength, or whatever. You know, however they want to make up bullshit like this and try to convince people that their their ideas or or whatever they want to spew is is good. 
It isn't. It's mostly crap. And I still believe in definitions of words and that they're important. I really do. And I know around here, many of you are well educated on things, but many others of you think you are, but you're not. I'm sorry, you're not. I don't mean it to be harsh. I don't mean it to be condescending that gamer knows everything. God, I don't. But one guy who's fairly new and he seems like a really great guy and been hanging out with him a lot marveled that Spain joined NATO while they had a fascist leader. And I go, what? You know? And I sort of lectured him that Franco was not fascist. He was not a fascist. I'm not saying he was a good guy. I'm just saying he wasn't fascist. And this means something. Franco was a nationalist, okay? Franco was a nationalist. Yes, he was a dictator. Yes, he was an authoritarian. Yes, he or his government did bad things. I'm not saying that by saying he wasn't a fascist means that he's all right or he's good or whatever. No, it's just he is not a fascist. He is a nationalist. Yes, during World War II, at least for part of it, the Fran or Spain's um, foreign minister, uh, Serrano, or something like that, you pronounce it, he was a member of Spain's phalangist, or fascist, is just what they call themselves in Spain, party. So his, he, Franco being a nationalist, who restores on his deathbed, or, or as part of his will, restoring uh, the, the Spanish monarchy. Does that make him a monarchist? Well, he, not enough of one to bring the monarchy back in when he was still alive. But he, Franco led a right-wing coalition government, okay, that included some fascists. Yes, it included some fascists. But he himself the best of my knowledge was you know, he never joined the fascist party he never called himself a fascist he was not a fascist he was a dictator he was a nationalist he was an authoritarian he was not a totalitarian because totalitarians do not um, either allow or they argue against the idea of competing political parties and he allowed competing political parties because they weren't all of the fascist party. He just, they were all right-wing parties or acceptable parties to him, but there were multiple political parties. So he was not a totalitarian. He was an authoritarian. Okay. So that part of the rant. Franco was not a fascist. He may be a very bad guy, but he wasn't a fascist. He did not start the Spanish Civil War. He was hanging out down here when it started. Now, once the coup, once the right, once the right wing coup against the leftist government failed, because the leftist government had assassinated um, not the leading, um, most popular um, general in the army, which wasn't Franco, was I forget this other guy. Um, gets um, picked up by the police, driven away from his home, and found the next morning somewhere in, in a gutter in the street, shot multiple times. So he did he make it to the police department, and they shot him at the police department and took him away, or did they just drive him somewhere in this city, say, get out of the car and just shoot him? I don't know. Or was he trying to escape? But hey, he peacefully went into the police car and rode away. Maybe maybe they were he could tell that they weren't driving him to the police station. They were taking him out to somewhere else and he tried to, you know, realize that they're gonna take me out to the field somewhere and shoot me and you bury my body and I just disappear. Maybe that's what he thought and tried to escape. I don't know, but he's killed in police custody. Um after peacefully surrendering. And that gets a group or in Spanish a junta of generals to, to try to do a, in Spain, 
try to do a coup against the government. That fails, and then they bring up Franco and his army of Africa and really sort of kicks off the Civil War, but Franco doesn't start it. Um, and bad things happen. In the Civil War, after the Civil War, bad things happen. Both sides, bad things happen. But Spain is torn apart. Um, and the reason I'm just going over all this is because we'll get to Portugal in a minute. But Spain is torn apart by the Civil War. It is devastated by the Civil War. Spain was still mostly an agrarian country at the time uh, of the start of the Civil War. It was going through a slow motion communist revolution that was mostly winning uh, elections, but there were both right and left wing death squads. Hence the police killing the general. That was a left wing death squad that wore badges. Um, and it was moving, you know, moving more and more radically to the left. It's really only under Franco later on does he sort of get Spain somewhat industrialized. But Spain is lagging behind. A lot of the agriculture in Spain in 1936 was still muscle powered, meaning either animals or humans, meaning as opposed to tractors and trucks. They were, you know, animals and pulling plows, that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe some, you know, mechanical whirling things behind the animals. You know, um, you can look at some late 19th century agricultural implements that are fairly advanced, but they are, again, operating by being towed by animals as opposed to being um, powered normally by gasoline engines, but powered by, by something else. There's still a lot of Europe is still, you know, um, into the 1970s, they were still using... Um, uh, I know just talking to a, a Danish person um, into like, like 1960s, 1970s, they were still using uh, farm animals in as in in in, the, in Denmark for commercial agriculture. Okay, not sort of um, hobbyist reasons, but you know, the farmer would have a wagon and some, some animals to pull it, and not a truck kind of thing. And something that Americans would be scoffing at. That, and that's, that's Denmark. Um, so you can imagine Spain's a lot worse. And there's real, and this is, and, you know, when you have periods of starvation, or at least in starvation in parts of Spain and low food everywhere in Spain, Who's going to get, like, the least amount of food? Oh, prisoners. Um, you know, so that's part of some of the uh, people dying in some of the prison camps are literally because there's just not enough food in Spain. And there's a lot of people locked up in prison camps because of, you know, they were the soldiers on the losing side of the war, uh, basically. Uh, some of them are either known to have or suspected to be part of massacres that massacred nuns and priests and other, you know, very non-combatant types that they would just go into a monastery or a nunnery and just shoot everybody, you know, all nuns and priests. What were the nuns and priests doing so bad other than, you know, living, you know, because they weren't, these aren't even necessarily the preachers going out and, you know, preaching Christianity. These are just Marxist revolutionaries wanting to destroy the church and kill the people off. So, yeah, some of that, so there's not just, you know, there's reasons why some of these people were in prisoner of war camps, because they were known to belong to some unit that was involved in these things. Now, whether you know, some of these units are known that, well, maybe only 20% of the people in, you know, you know, one company went in and did this massacre, but the rest of the battalion might have done other massacres, but they don't know who was in, you know, records aren't good. So there's a lot of reasons there's people in prisoner of war camps well after the, um, the Civil War is over. Um, yeah, so, you know, bad things happen. I'm not, gonna, I'm not saying, you know, Franco was some, and I'll get to Aries and other people and IKB's comments here in a moment. Um, 
aren't, you know, I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to whitewash Franco. I'm just trying to use the right words for, for identifying people and things. Okay, so Franco knows that to get Spain, get Spain into World War II, it's not a good thing for Spain. There's just not going to be a, even if Germany wins and is all conquering of its enemies, Franco may be figuring he wasn't um, Germany's enemy, so they wouldn't try to conquer me. Italy might, because Italy, I don't know if it's Spain's enemy, but um, that Mussolini guy wants to have the new Roman Empire, and Spain was part of the Roman world, and so I don't know. But um, there, you know, even if even if the even if Germany's on the winning side, Spain is so torn up that it just isn't going to benefit Spain to get into the war. Okay, so what he does is, and he's Hitler or Franco smart enough and says to Hitler, he doesn't say no. He says, "Okay, I'll do that. I first need this long list of stuff, sort of like what um, the list of stuff that." Um, Hitler says to Stalin or Ribbentrop says to Molotov or whatever, says, we need all this oil, this food, this um, whatever, and minerals and whatnot shipped into us as part of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact and onward commercial agreements from there. And Stalin ships all that stuff to Germany to keep Germany from invading uh, for a while. Um, it's sort of that kind of a list, but Franco knows that Germany, not it wasn't so big that he technically couldn't fulfill the list, but it was so big that Germany probably wasn't going to be able to. So it was a good way of you know, not saying no, just saying, well, as soon as you can do all these things to make us military efficient to be able to go for it, we'll, we'll join you. We're with you, buddy, but first this. So it was a way to say no. But okay, in this reality here, I, I could see, you know, oh, and like some of it was like, hey, yeah, um, territory, give us Morocco. Well, that was part of Vichy France. If you give it Morocco, if you give Spain Morocco, well, Vichy France, that's a problem. I mean, that is a problem because Germany does not, I repeat this, Germany does not have the manpower to fully occupy France and fight all their, you know, the Eastern Front and other fronts. They just do not have the manpower to effectively occupy all of France. So they do a deal with the Vichy saying, yeah, this, you know, is unoccupied France and this is occupied France and this little bit over here is now Germany back again from world that had been before World War One, but that's Germany. Now you're going to keep there. You know we're going to have police in Paris. You know French police in Paris and French police everywhere, um, and they're going to maintain order in France. We're going to put some garrison troops along, you know, the coast and whatnot to make sure those English guys don't become troublesome. But France had better be peaceful. We are not, you know, if you want to keep your colonies, well, okay, you got to give up um, Indochina to, to Japan. But if you want to keep the rest of your colonies, you want to keep, eh, you know, it's somewhat the less populated part because most of it's around this sort of area. It's the major population area of France, at least at the time. You know, but, you know, maybe I'm not almost half of your country unoccupied, you know, home territory unoccupied. You want to keep that unoccupied and keep all your possessions. You better, you better be peaceful. We better not have rebellion. And that goes a long ways to keeping France from becoming a powder keg and having... Um, a lot of problems for the Germans. Now, we can see that there were once, you know, that goes away, there becomes a lot more problems. And there's a lot of German soldiers, as well as we can see a lot of um, Eastern peoples that are now rearmed that are occupying France. And it's never effectively occupied enough. And it's hugely drawing away troops from other needed theaters. 
even if they're second rate, you know, there's there's good good troops there too. But even if there's a bunch of second rate troops, well, they could be messing around in Yugoslavia or somewhere behind, you know, killing partisans behind the front lines on the Eastern Front or whatever. You know, it's there's other jobs for them to do. So yes, if you give up Morocco, that's chipping away. Now this also in this game, Italy took this during during its wars with um, France, so it got Tunisia. But okay, so let's just say you can induce Spain into the war. That that I would say is a possibility, a real possibility, not a probability. And it's just oh, you know, there's a five or ten percent chance. That it comes into it. Then you get to Portugal. Um, Salazar. He's in, he is the dictator of Portugal. He is of the party Nuovo State or the New State. It is best described from everything I read as a nationalist party and that Salazar was a nationalist. Now there is a party by the exact same name, the Nuovo State or Stat or whatever, in Brazil, and that party has been described as being a fascist party. Same name, different party, different country, both speak Portuguese. Um, but Salazar, is described as a nationalist. Yeah, he's picking and choosing within his ideology because he is sort of an ideological leader a bit more than Franco is. Some, maybe some elements from fascism, but not much. It's just a little bit. Salazar doesn't like, and I will get to some of your chat, Sari, don't worry. Um, Salazar doesn't like Hitler. Okay. And I'm not just sort of saying like, I'm, you know, I don't like him that much. No. He doesn't like them so much that he writes an anti-Hitler book. And it's published. He writes it. I'm trying to remember... Um, I'm forgetting the name. I, 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 and it's around the Nuremberg Code, you know, disliking the Nuremberg Code and sort of the, you know, the anti-Jewish elements there. It is a, you know, a whole book on why Hitler is bad, basically. So he writes a book. He hates Hitler enough that he sits down and writes a book and publishes a book in like 1936 or 1937 or some, some year like that, maybe 38, but definitely before 39. He writes and publishes a book. Why I hate, basically, why I hate Hitler kind of thing. And so, yeah. Now, he also respects the very old, if you will, alliance with England that's not always formalized, but does exist. And he um, doesn't want war to come to the Iberian Peninsula. He doesn't think war is going to help you know, Portugal at all. Doesn't want war anywhere near it. Now, I've thought about this a lot because I've coded, if you remember, um, Saladar was a leader who didn't take any shit. Yeah, when India took it. Yeah, we'll get to some of that. Um, Harry. Uh, when I coded up for the Third Reich events mod that I made, you know, I, I do have some events that move, you know, in the, in the alliance thing, ticket, ticks, Portugal closer to the Axis. And there are reasons that they would move closer to the Axis. Not like they're going to join the Axis, but move closer. And there's events that move Spain closer to the Axis. I've thought about this. And so what would realistically get 
Salazar into the Axis camp. And I also realize that once America enters the war, and I think it's it's either 42 or 43, he allows the Azores to be invaded by America. You could say he doesn't really have a choice. And it is, the Americans sort of, I think, present it like that, mostly so that Salazar doesn't have to say that he invited them in or he allowed them in. But America invades the Azores, but doesn't take over the Azores in the sense that the Portuguese, the small number, very small number, of Portuguese troops, they're still there, they're still armed. The police still function. All of the civil government still functions. It's just the Americans move in and set up some anti-submarine bases, both air to operate, you know, um, you know, PBYs and other things to go after the subs and to be able to, um, you know, dock ships there in, in the Azores. Now, my understanding is down here, there are some submarine bases that are built that I don't know if the Germans ever use. But the Germans sort of, my understanding, at least tech, not send workers, but send some technical advisors. You know, these are sort of like caves that are built into the sides of cliffs to be able to put some submarines into and whatnot. And I really don't know if, if the Germans ever actually operated out of them by the time that they were um, maybe completed. Spain is backing off, you know, some support from... Um, uh, the Axis, but, you know, there's like a radar station that the Germans build that um, the Spanish can't get into the radar station, you know, in, into it. Um, it's all German operated. Uh, and things like that that are, and, and that information is, you know, when they spot ships or aircraft moving around, they radio it to them. To the German, so it's a, it's a German listening post, and there's a few more of these things around Spain. But as things get worse and worse for Germany, Spain starts shutting these things down. Well, you know, so it's once America's fully into the war, then it it takes over this, um, you know, the islands here. I would say with compliance, if not covert permission from Salazar and the Portuguese. Doesn't want the war to come to Spain, but by the time that they're coming in there, ah, no one's really thinking Germany's going to invade. And it's after, um, you know, North Africa is um, secured by the Allies. So it's, you know, Germany's already starting to lose. Now to get Portugal in, of course, it, from my, my money, it would have to be only after um, Spain has come in, not before. And it would have to be super clear that the Axis was winning. Because, again, I don't think Portugal would want, or, you know, wants to come in. It would have to be very much along the idea that if they don't come in, you're going to more or less be invaded. Um, so, all, okay, this part of the world... I would say is more or less enough conquered, you know, but got to take out Malta, got to take out Gibraltar, got to have no allies, whether it's a neutral Vichy France or whether it's, you know, Vichy France in the, or somebody, you know, access, fully access controlled down here. Realize that there is, and I think Ari sort of alluded to it, um, Goa, which is here, and then there's Dewey, which is, I think, sort of here. 
little sort of island place, sort of like a little mini Hong Kong, but a bit smaller. Um, that I think Dewey is the oldest European colony in India. Um, so it is ancient, you know, well before the British and the French show up. They're going to lose that. Um, this does not get occupied. Macau does not get occupied. Oh, oh, also Salazar hates the Japanese with a burning passion as well. Hates the Japanese. Um, Macau is not um, occupied, and these are not a little bit of Portuguese territory out here is not occupied by the Japanese. But he hates the Japanese. And so, yeah, that would be under threat. But, um, you know, they, he knows that they, not that this is important, but, um, you know, down here, Angola, Port, and um, Mozambique. And realize Spain holds on to Angola and Mozambique. And um, here, um, Bissau or Guinea Bissau, as it's sort of called today, until 1975. What happens in 1975? Salazar dies, um, and basically the army who is sick of fighting in these wars because it's a conscript army and it's been going on for, oh, I don't know, 10, 20 years, eh, probably more like 10 years, mid-60s or something, that there's basically sort of an army revolt about go, you know, sending conscripts off to fight in these wars, and they don't want to do it. So that's only on Salazar's after Salazar's death, you finally see Portugal's African colon, you know, um, empire collapsing. So that would have collapsed, you know, unless things are going well. And so, yeah, this here may be sort of kind of going well enough, like I say, but without this around here, I'm just not buying that this would be um, conditioned. Oh, also, it... Um, yeah, I think that needs to be taken. Moscow. And probably like Leningrad or something like that. I'm not saying that if there's a continuing war in the East, Salazar wouldn't join into the Axis. But it's got to look like the Soviets are have no chance of defeating and you know driving into berlin it might be a situation like i say if moscow's taken it might be a situation that the soviets you know, have enough factories have enough resources and industry to sort of keep things alive enough that they keep the germans from overrunning them but very much on the defensive in the back so yeah to some degrees, this is sort of getting close enough, but not anywhere near close enough that I would say that Portugal comes in. And now let's look at some of the, the chat. Sorry for taking some time. The real interest, okay, back to earlier. The real interesting question is who owns the undersea cables and pipelines in international waters? Who would attack on them count as an act of war against? Okay, that's a very interesting question. I'll get to that in a bit, um, but I want to first go through airy stuff on Franco since we're sort of on the topic. I'm always seeing Franco as a man who needed to play a balancer in the face of the fascists, so he wasn't um, so he wasn't um, coo cooed by them. Well, there was a um, post Franco. There wasn't a, a, a half-hearted, half-assed or worst um, fascist attempt at a coup in Spain that utterly fails. Um, you know, the strongest party, I would say, in Italy, the political party movement, is monarchism during this time period. And that keeps um, Mussolini in check. And ultimately, you know, because Mussolini does add fascist you know, battalions to regular division, but the army is, is a royalist, and maybe the Navy and the Air Force as well, but definitely the army is a royalist institution. Um, it's never taken over by the fascists. Yeah, so... And there's still a king, and so that's the balance. 
I would say there's a lot of monarchists, and, and obviously Spain is a monarchy today. And monarchists don't always necessarily have to mean the king is the, you know, absolute ruler of the country. It could be, yeah, hey, you know, the king's cool, and he, he sort of sits around, and he sort of, like, you know, can dismiss parliament. To, to, you know, like, if he thinks, you know, if, of course, if, you know, prime minister asks him to dismiss parliament to hold new elections, but if he thinks things are going on, yeah, you know, a bit bit wonky and, you know, politically and within society, you go, yeah, yeah, we're going to dismiss parliament and hold new elections. Or, hey, yeah, you got to, you got to like check with me before you, you make anybody minister. I have to sign off on them. So if I really think somebody is like, you know, a really bad egg because somebody shows me some, you know, secret photos of them doing weird things with shorter humans, if you get my meaning, or something like that, but they don't quite want to break it out into the open just to save, you know, face. Oh, yeah, you know, the king, you know, can, you know, you know, if they have reasons to to block somebody in. You know, so, so you know, a king can just sort of like, you're sort of saying there, Ari, you know, sort of play the role of a balancer. Um, you know, so the monarchists, the traditionalists, if you want to call them that, maybe, the church, those, the, the strong religious types which aren't necessarily going down the fascist path, though fascism and Catholicism aren't, they're at odds for structural problems, okay? Mussolini does a deal with the church that allows the church to have the kids when they're really young in running, the relig running the schools in Italy, not just the religious schools, but all schools in Italy. Once they get older, the state takes over, meaning the fascist party takes over. You know, so... There is some sort of structural problems, but ideological in the, you know, well, yeah, ideological too, because if you believe in the nunneries and the monasteries that are the church holding large chunks, chunks of land, that is against fascist um, ideology because fascism is everything for the state. But if you're just talking about just the religion, uh, religious aspects, you know, of, of you know, religious sermons and having churches and cathedrals, fascism isn't necessarily um, conflicting with it. But there's also, like I say, there's a lot of traditionalism going on. So yeah, but he he's a pragmatic man of the right, for sure, um, Franco is. Um, but yeah, IKB's comment is very interesting, and I want to get to that. Okay, not Spain-related, but I've always been angry that people who... Um, compliment the USSR fail to understand that USSR's entire industry and agricultural basis was by Western con uh, by the West constantly had to buy Western equipment absolutely Western tools Western vehicles industrialization of their own well yeah um, the Soviet Union in Let's just put out a number. 1939 cannot, I want to repeat this, the Soviet Union in 1939 cannot, as far as I know, prove me wrong if you, if you can. I'd love to be proven wrong because I learned more. Um, because then I want to know these things. Cannot build the T-34 or the KV tanks. They cannot build them. It is impossible for the Soviet Union to build them. Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact comes along. We're all good buddies now. We're allies in radicalism. Hey, Germany, I want to buy some big steel rolling mills. Um, you know, like the ones that you use to build the ships and build that really thick armor for the ships. Germany goes, well, we need that oil. We need the food from the Ukraine. If necessary, Stalin will, you know, starve out all the Ukraine again just to, you know, hold it a more too if we need to, to get us the food that we need. Yeah, okay, we'll sell them the steel rolling mill. You know, they can waste their time building some ships. We'll just sink them with our U-boats. No problem. Yeah. Those st steel rolling mills that they couldn't... now. Eventually, the Soviet Union could have built the mills. I'm not saying they couldn't, could, couldn't have in time built the mills, but they couldn't in like 1939, 1940. They couldn't roll the, the steel armor at the right thicknesses, because if you look at all of the earlier Soviet tanks, they're fairly thin armor. They cannot 
roll the heavy armor. Um, Germany sells them the mills or mill setup to be able to make the armor for the T-34 and the KV series and down the road. And yes, you, I'm not saying that the Soviet Union doesn't can't expand eventually, but he sells them to him. The standard Soviet motorcycle, the factory set up by the Germans. Okay, I I don't I forget it whether it's the BMW, the Z Puds, or one of the main motorcycles. That's the German motorcycle. The Soviets make thousands or tens of thousands of these motorcycles. Again, the factory set up by the Germans. The standard standard Soviet anti tank gun at the time of the invasion this actually happens I think a little bit before um, is a 45 millimeter anti-tank gun if you look at it it is a licensed copy of the PAC 36 which is a 37 the Soviets work with the Germans and up the scale from 37 millimeter to 45 millimeter but it is a licensed copy Germany sets up the factory for the anti-tank guns okay again this is Germany setting up the Soviet industry the, the Soviets can do some of these things, but it's going to take them a lot longer, and their production levels aren't nearly enough. And they do buy other machinery that allows them to make machine tools, certainly. So and all the way up until the collapse of the Soviet Union, they have to buy a lot of um, industrial capacity through the whole period. Okay, you rarely hear about it. Yes, Perón too was a fascist leader. I really, you know, okay, um, Perón um, down in Argentina. I'm not sure, and I'm not going to claim to know. I've watched a few movies, including the, you know, the things, but... Um, now he is, I mean, he was alive during World War II, but he was in power, if I'm not mistaken, you know, in the 50s mostly. Um, and I don't know that he was fascist. I'm not saying he wasn't, I just don't know. I don't know enough on Perón of Argentina. Uh, Salazar was leader who didn't take any shit. Yes, India took over Gawa and other Portuguese colonies. He just created governments in exile and never acknowledged that. I didn't know that he did the governments in exile. Okay, I also respect Hothi and um, Boris. They weren't evil or bad, just men in a position neither uh, either join or die every time they could. They acted against Germany. Yeah, um, yeah, I wouldn't call either of them evil. Um, unless it's the banality of evil, you know not fighting, giving in to evil and not fighting it. But, um, yeah, we, you know, they both worked to save their what they could of their Jewish populations, yes. Though um, I know in Bulgaria's case, even though they get this territory over here, they allow Jews to be deported from their newly acquired territory, which would be citizens and i think all the jews would have signed up to be bulgarian citizens if it meant not to be deported so you're getting a little little on the iffy there hello tinky tinky tink how you doing you suspect balbo for how he treated the german inspections of libya showed jewish temples and architectures with pride sassy guy yeah um mussolini also um at one point makes a speech that Jews have always been part of Rome, blah, blah, blah. Um, fascism as expressed by Mussolini, and he is the founder of fascism, and there's also some other fascist thinkers around, and I I don't know it like I, you know, and who all these people are like, I sort of know, you know, um, Goebbels and all the, the various Nazi guys, so I don't know it well. I, I know bits and pieces. It is not a racial or pri 
you know, I'm not saying they weren't racist and thought thinking that they were better than, say, Africans or something like that. But um, and I don't know the average fascist view of whether they're I'm a culturalist people. I look at culture. I, I grew up in I live in, you know, in Southern California in a multicultural ver- world. And I've met people that were, say, Japanese that were the third or fourth generation here in America. And I've met Japanese, you know, right off the plane from Japan. And those are very different peoples. Okay. Very different peoples. And so I, I believe culture is the main difference between large groups of people. That's what I believe. And so it's culture. I don't, and I do think looking back in the past, they often use the term race for like the race of Frenchmen or something. And they're not necessarily meaning bloodlines, but they're sort of sort of kind of meaning culture, but they're also sort of kind of meaning bloodlines. And so 19th century viewpoints between race and culture, I don't know how strong or, and it can vary from, you know, different sorts of expression of them. I remember um, reading about um, a guy running for parliament who um, I think in the southeast of England was, and this is in before World War II, maybe even before World War I, but pretty early in there. And he is um, railing against foreign influence in Britain. He was very, very, you know, British, British, British. He was born in India, okay? He, he was, you know, obviously, you know, pro the, the British Empire and all of that kind of stuff. So that you, you get, get the idea that people aren't always, you know, and he was someone, I think, I think he grew up mostly in Britain or something. Um, you know, and spoke in a British manner and not like a, an Indian. Um, you know, and he was running for parliament uh, in there. So I don't know how much they viewed it. Also, when like Hitler visits Rome one of the times, you see uh, some of the photos in Third Reich events in which um, proudly displayed um, are um, high-ranking individuals from black Africa, you know, Ethiopia or Somalia or Eritrea. I'm not exactly sure. Um, but as sort of um, being shown off, but in a very positive light, um, you know, as part of the greater new Roman Empire. Best as I can understand, um, you know, Mussolini wants like this, not maybe necessarily looking going deep into, you know, the Balkans, but once the coast, and he wants to turn all these people Italian, but it's not in the Nazi sort of way of killing off the local people and shipping Italians in. He wants to teach all these people Italian or their children, you know, not necessarily like, like immediately they all become Italian, but over the generations to have these all become Italians by teaching them Italian, by enculturating them in Italy. So at least when we're talking about Europe, Europe, or Europeans or whatever, as far as I can tell with fascist Italy, it is entirely a cultural viewpoint, not a racial one. So Mussolini and the fascist in Italy are not on a um, massive anti-Jewish track. And you really, to the best of my knowledge, the only time you get um, export, you know, taking Jews out of Italy to you know, camps and places is after the fall of Mussolini. Now, of course, when it's the Italian Social Republic up where Mussolini is being the puppet, they're taking the Jews out. He has, he's lost all real power. He's just sort of some figurehead pseudo administrator un, under German puppetry. But yeah, it's Mussolini, Balboa, um, who, you know, is get sh- shot down by Italian anti-aircraft. I know there's suspicions that it was Mussolini's orders because he's you know, jealous of him. I don't quite think so. I just think it was, you know, mistaken aircraft and he gets shot down. So, yeah, I'm, you know, has a street and a statue in Chicago, I believe. Yeah, very well could, Harry. I have no clue of Soviets during the time. They only 
appeared on our curriculum for Ribbentrop and after Barbarossa started. Okay, interesting. I think after the Soviets failed in Poland, they were not nearly as well situated as they made the world believe. The Soviets had an internal war during the time. No clue, but really I expect happened in the 30s and 40s. Okay. Only reason the Poles lost against them in World War II is because of the old Polish leaders told them not to fight them. Um, they told them not to fight, but I would, they were going to be overrun anyways. They couldn't. They were doing their best to evacuate as much as they could into Romania by that point in the war. Um, they couldn't have hold. They couldn't. They they. Poland just doesn't have the resources to hold a two-front war. Just doesn't. Hello, NMDB. Italians showed off Italianized Ethiopians. Oh no, they were no, no, they weren't um, to Nazi visitors much to their disgust. Well, I don't know if the I don't I don't have the reactions of the Nazi visitors, but they weren't Italian. I mean, they were wearing um, African-style clothing. Which was you know because which was you know full coverings they weren't they weren't wearing primitive clothes but they weren't wear they weren't dressed as like Italian in Italian clothes they were were dressed in in African or Eritrean or Somali type clothes um, you know flowing robes and that kind of stuff they weren't they weren't hiding their ethnicity they these weren't um, look we've civilized people out there and made them look Italian no these were from the photos that I've seen, these were, hey, look at our, our exotic peoples from our empire kind of thing. Um, so they, yeah, so they weren't, and I don't know that they particularly spoke Italian either, um, but they were, they were at least in Rome for the, you know, Hitler's visit, and I don't know how they got there, meaning were they just there anyways, and trotted out for the, because there was a big parade, and you could see that there were also lines of, you know, Italian soldiers, and lots of flags being flown, and people being, you know, around, so it was during a big sort of thing. So I don't know whether they were just flown up from, you know, Eritrea or wherever, for the occasion or if they were already you know in rome for whatever reason but yeah so that's as far as i can tell um there's a lot of difference a lot more than most people think between fascism and nazism including core beliefs nazism our national socialism as expressed by adolf hitler it's a religion people it is a religion because it goes into not just like economics and politics of economics and your econo and political structures. It's going into um, fundamental religious beliefs, and it is very anti-Christian. Hitler does believe in a higher power, and I think as life goes on, he believes in it more and more, mainly around um, always being saved from all these assassination attempts and probably being saved from the wounds in World War I. He very much believes in a higher power, but it is not the Christian God. In fact, I think he believes, and, and I've read several books on the topic, and some of the authors, they all, they all agree that he's not a Christian, but they conflict on whether he's a pagan or some other sort of neo-type things. The Nazis thought Italians were trying to offend him. They might have, and then DB, I, like I say, I've not read of the reaction what the Nazis had of them but um, they very well might have. Um, yeah, so, um, but yeah, it's, the Nazis are, tr are trying to erode Christianity. And Hitler, Hitler, one of the occasions talking about this subject was, is, um, talks about his mother, who's dead, obviously, by that point. But um, I wouldn't want to, I forget, you know, um, lock up or, or imprison my mother for her beliefs. No, no, we just, we're going to leave the people be, you know, um, in their religious beliefs, but we're going to get to the young and raise them in a non-Christian way. So they ban religious schools. Everybody must go to the state schools. All the kids, all the, the right type of kids, meaning not Jews, not others, um, but all the right type of kids have got to go to the Hitler Youth, and so that they want to erode any sort of Christianity within them. So 
So Hitler's Hitler's methods for dealing when dealing with good Germans is more let them have let them be Protestant, let them be Catholic or whatever. We're just going to road the next generation as it comes along's beliefs in any sort of Christianity. And um, that's their methods of dealing with it. But it and it's to replace not like the Soviet atheist, which atheism is a religion, people. Religion is is, you know, a belief of I mean, how do I put it shortly? You know, of how and why things, you know, got created and happened and whatnot. So atheism, well, just believes that there's no gods. That's a type of belief, you know. Okay, so that's sort of Sovietism is, you know, and Marxist-Leninist, Sovietism, whatever you want to call it, is a, um, does have a religious component in that it is anti any sort of belief in higher powers. National Socialism is putting this sort of neo... I, I, I think it's more of a neo-paganism um, viewpoint, but um, it is... And some of these authors, is some other sort of spiritualism or whatever, but it, it is a spiritualism. It is a belief in a higher power. But it... And so... and it, But it's expressed through the party and the will of the people and the whole blood and soil thing, and it's... It's all of that, where fascism doesn't have a um, a religious component. Now they believe in the state for organizing humanity, and so say something. Not that the monastery exists is bad, but the monastery, um, say, administering a bunch of farmland, that is bad because it needs to be organized by the state. So owning, so the church owning properties outside of the actual religious buildings, you know, the, whether it's the cathedral or a housing place for, you know, um, monks or nuns or something, you know, a nunnery or monastery or something, outside of owning that type of property is a no-no under fascism. Fascism, Nazism, Fascism, which comes out of socialism, and socialism and the extreme versions of socialism are communism. All of these ideologies are all collectivists. Okay, they all believe that the land and the means of production are owned collectively. The communists and socialists want to get rid of what they see as the national state, not necessarily the government, but the national state, and they believe that the the the, the state is what should own and manage the means of production. The fascists believe it, 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 it believe it is a collectivist, but it is not a it is not a leveling, meaning everybody should be equal ideology. It believes in hierarchies. And so some people, maybe that you know, whether they're a sports star, you know, football or whatever, or whether they are just the um, you know, a an advanced machinist is going to get paid more than a, an apprentice machinist a, or a standard, you know, you know, non-apprentice but not advanced machine. You know, meaning you can have a hierarchy of of, of being paid, or you can, you know, um, own a, a a factory, but whether solely or you know, set it up in partnership or shares or whatever. But society is going to be administered by the state, organized by the state, so that everything is well-balanced and well-functioning, and centrally planned, okay, centrally planned. Um, the National Socialist, under Hitler, does not like central planning. Hitler wants competition. He doesn't want what he sees as the exploitative nature of capitalism, meaning, uh, you know, and market capitalism, not just capitalists, but also capitalists as in people with capital. He doesn't want the idea of the factory to try to pay as little as possible to the workers and sell the product as, ex as, as high as possible to the public to maximize profit. What he wants is factories different companies to compete each other, compete against each other, like shoe manufacturers, who makes the best shoe or the most stylish shoe or whatever. He wants that competition 
to happen because he believes um, in sort of a Darwinian viewpoint of the world. So he does not, and he gets centralized planning under Speer, but only because it's the war. Only because it's the war, not because that's what he wants. So he wants shoe companies to, to compete against each other, but he wants to make sure that all of the workers all get what, I guess use a modern term, a living wage so that there are no grindingly poor people. Obviously, there'll be richer and poorer people in the, in the, in the spectrum, but they will all make a good minimum sort of wage. And outside of some, you know, Hitler's not against the idea of a luxury brand, you know, of, of high-end goods for just a few people. But we're talking for the what he wants to see is basically the middle class in Germany. You can't overly charge too much for your shoes. And even if there becomes a scarcity, like for some reason, everybody's shoes all fall apart. I don't know why. There's a flood or whatever. And everybody wants to run out and buy shoes. He won't allow prices to climb because of scarcity. Prices can climb because of, say, if materials become more expensive or something, well, then, of course, prices will need to climb, but not just because of scarcity, like, well, hey, they'll pay $5 instead of $4 for the shoes just because they need them now. No, those are $4 shoes. You get to sell them for $4 shoes just because people are willing to hand over more money doesn't mean you get to exploit the society. So it's collective ownership so long as you're not exploitive or and you, you can be privately and individually run and competitively run so long as you're not exploiting the collective. And then once you exploit the collective, well, then the state will step in and correct that exploiting of the collective. So you say Nazism is a religion in the same way as Christianity is not quite right. Hitler believed in something he called providence. Nazism is insanely materialistic. Um... NMDB, I would highly recommend the book called Hitler's Monsters. That is a great, you can find it on Amazon. It is a great book. I, I, I'm betting on that book as being the best one. And then there's another one um, also you can get on Amazon, Hitler's Religion. I've read both of the books. Well, actually, technically, I've listened to them. I list, it was while I was working at a job that I could um, spend about six to eight hours a day listening to things on the audio, but I couldn't have a book with me. So um, I've in, in reading these books and whatnot, I've looked at it, and you can look at sort of the extreme views of you know, Himmler and expressed within the SS. Those are different views than Hitler, um, but they were working, uh, they were working along similar lines, but Hit Himmler was going further than Hitler. But Hitler wasn't stopping or putting brakes on Himmler's viewpoints within the SS. He was running through it's, it's through the party was going to express it and they had yet to create a clergy if you will they tried to create a nazi christian thing that failed utterly and it was meant really to be a subversive element within christianity and sort of try to d destroy christianity with from within within germany it really wasn't an, an honest um take on um on Christianity. So, um, yeah, and you have to watch with Hitler. Um, he contradicts himself all the time, literally in the same day. Because he'll give a speech to um, one group of people like workers, ah, oh, you know, I'm going to do this, and then go give a speech to a smaller group of industrialists and literally contradict himself running for campaigns. So people often with Hitler will find the thing that supports their thesis and go, Hitler was Christian because he went to a you know a cathedral and he spoke and he praised Christianity and whatnot. Well, yeah, and... Mussolini asks Hitler in a private situation, you know, 
relatively private, not in like a big public thing. There were some other people around him. I think on the trip, trip, the same trip to Rome that um, we were talking about. And how do you deal with a church? Mussolini uh, uh, or, um, asks Hitler. And Hitler's response was, I don't have any Christians around me, or, or words to that effect. And with that, I looked around. Every single one of Hitler's sort of inner circle types, none of them are Christians. Absolutely none of them are Christians. Um, anybody who is high up in the German um, hierarchies, you know, whether it's in the Navy, in the Army, in civil service, government, um, there are Christians, most notably Franz von Papen, who's a Catholic, who was, of course, Chancellor of Germany before Hitler, gets and the reshuffle gets demoted and created because it's not always a vice chancellorship as a as a position, but good position created as vice chancellor to sort of with Hindenburg on top and uh, von Poppen below. It was meant to lock in and keep Hitler from being having too much power. Uh, Franz von Poppen, for all of his faults in the world, he was a very strong Catholic Christian. He. Um, continues with that belief, involves in the Knights of whatever, I think the um, sort of successing element coming out of the, Mal the, the Knights, I guess St. John or whatever, of Malta, I think it was that, or one of the other ones is, is involved in that. And so he's very high up in it. As soon as Hindenburg is gone, his position is eliminated, and even um, when he is in his position, he is not part of Hitler's inner circle. When, after it's eliminated, he is sent to special envoy to Austria, whose mission is to get Austria into the Reich. So he, he and he's sent there particularly because he's a Catholic. Austria, obviously, being a Catholic country, um, so and a quote unquote acceptable kind of guy. Franz von Papen is never really a Nazi because he's a Christian. He dislikes a lot of Hitler, but he, he, I would say, mistakenly believes that Hitler is just a bump in the road, and then once Hitler dies, Germany's going to go back to being Germany or whatever. Um, it's just a phase that they're going through, I think, is what he probably tells himself. I have not read about too much of a biography on him. And then once Austria comes in, he loses his job because there's no longer, you know, an Austria to be special envoy from. And then I forget, but eventually he's sent down, well, sort of Ankara, but also um, spending a lot of his time, I think, in Istanbul um, as Germany's basic special envoy, whatever, to, um, to Turkey. I think sometime around 1944, he's recalled home to Germany. And he doesn't go. I, you know, now he's maybe pleads to the wounds or something in the assassination attempt or whatever it is, but he refuses to go back to Germany until the war is over because he knows he will not fare well, be, partially because, and I don't think he really tries, but he doesn't get his mission, is, of course, is to get Turkey into the Axis. Um, and he does not. So, um, Hello, Corporal uh, Rivna. How you doing? And Beam Slam is here. Hello, how you doing? So yeah, that's why don't I play Hoi Four? Um, well, I just I've been playing this game. I think well, well we're going to end this episode here. I want to thank you all for for getting this far and listening to all my talks. I will see you next time for more. Yes, more Hearts of Iron.